because of God's blessing, the, the work that I do, the, the life's work that I have, it, it's all available perfectly free online. And, and there's three main, well, four main places you can get my resources. Uh, you, you can get them uh, at our website, which is EnduringWord.com. Uh, if you just did a Google search for Enduring Word or just type in that address, EnduringWord.com, that'll take you to all my resources. And I need to say something about that website very quickly, is my first visit to Kenya uh, and really any part of, of Africa was uh, last year. And some dear brothers really kind of, uh, uh, com they, they sort of begged me to translate some of my commentary into Swahili. Because we have translation works in many languages. But honestly, we're dealing mostly with big languages, you know, like the 10 most used languages in the world. But these brothers were so sweet, these Maasai brothers who were just really asking that. We went ahead and on uh, the EnduringWord.com website, under the commentary menu, you can find my Romans commentary translated into Swahili, and we're, we're working on more of that. So if you know anybody who might benefit from that, just show them that from the website. So we have the website. Uh, we have an app that is absolutely free, and you can get it for your phone. Uh, the app is really good, and many, many people use my resources on the app. Then I'm also on a website called Blue Letter Bible. Uh, Many of you use the content on Blue Letter Bible. Uh, and then uh, we also have a YouTube channel that puts out a lot of content. So all of that stuff is just absolutely free. And uh, we just want it to be a blessing to people. Do you want me to keep talking or? <laughs> well, come on in, guys, those who are outside. And let's begin this Q&A session. Um, I don't know why I always doubt whether people are going to ask questions. We've never had a Q&A where there's not several hundred questions, more than we can answer. So I just want to, to warn you, if you don't get your question answered, um, forgive us. We just don't have the time to go through 200 questions. We would need four hours to do that. Um, there are great questions here, and we thank you for uh, bringing them. But because I have so many questions already, all these with multiple questions on almost every paper, we're actually just going to stop. Uh, so we're going to not take any more questions. And um, we're going to try to get through in the next 45 minutes to an hour. I know we're behind schedule, but we always are because we're in Africa. <laughs> and then after this time, we're going to have a time of fellowship. We may cut it down from an hour to like 40 minutes where we uh, have some snacks in the classrooms over here. You guys can come and ask more questions and have conversations with Pastor David and any of our pastors here at the church. And so let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll get into this. Lord, please help us to um, give biblical answers. Help Pastor David and help us to understand. We know, Lord, that a lot of these questions asked are asked because of pain mm. and heartache. And help us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading and give us wisdom on answering questions that really come from experiences. And we pray that you would do your work now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Jude 24 says, God is able to keep us from falling. Does a born-again Christian have to continually fall, or can we become perfect uh, before we get to heaven? The answer to this question, a lot of times, depends on what people mean by the words that they're asking. So let me kind of make a distinction here. A person can stumble and not fall. We're not going to become perfect on this side of eternity. 
God promises every believer that we will be glorified, but we're going to have to deal with the world, the flesh, and the devil until we pass from this life to the next. So there will be no perfection. We're going to stumble along the way. But we don't have to fall, and we certainly don't have to fall away. We can be secure in Jesus Christ. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter when Jesus was washing all the disciples' feet and he came to Peter and Peter said, no, Lord, you won't wash my feet. And Jesus said, "Uh, hey, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part with me. And then Peter said, oh, well, then wash my whole body. You know, Peter's always trying to tell Jesus what to do. Uh, And then Jesus said this, you're already clean, I just need to wash your feet. And there's a sense in which that's what it's like for the life of the believer. We are clean before God, but our feet that come in contact with the world around us sometimes get dirty, and we need to come to Jesus for continual cleansing. So we can stumble, but we don't have to fall away by any means. Um... Let me ask a question to you guys. How many of you are visiting us and you are members of different churches? Raise your hand if you're a member of a different church. Welcome. Welcome. God Very bless glad you you've come here today. God bless you. God bless you. I can tell by all the questions answer, asked that we have many visitors, so we want to welcome you. Um, well, let me just combine... Their questions I, uh, on this one paper. Is God in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, and in the New Testament, the same person? And um, in terms of baptism, they, they think, uh, they are asking, why does are all those who are baptized in the New Testament baptized in Jesus Christ's name? Why do we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Those two questions. Okay, well, first of all, about the God of the Old Testament and Jesus. God revealed himself to Israel in the Old Testament as Yahweh. That's the name of God. You know, the Canaanites had a God named Baal. They had another God named Ashereth. The uh, Moabites had a God named Milcom, Chemosh. The, The different peoples had their different gods. The God of Israel is Yahweh. Well, he wasn't just the God of Israel. He's the God of all the earth. And the proper way to understand this is like this. Yahweh is God, and we find in the Bible that God the Father is Yahweh, God the Son is Yahweh, God the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. One God in three persons. So when the Bible uses that term Yahweh, Many times in your Bible, it's represented by the word LORD, written in all capital letters. That's referring to the triune God, the Godhead. So you could just say, well, since Jesus is Yahweh, you could say, well, yes, it's part of the Godhead doing that work. So what we need to understand is that in their character, in their nature, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are alike. It's not like they have different characters, different natures. They're different persons, but they are the one God, same in nature and character. Listen, the God of the Old Testament is much more loving than many people realize. And the God of the New Testament has more judgment than most people realize. It's one God across the entire Bible, perfectly revealed to us in Jesus Christ. What he was saying uh, about the Old Testament and New Testament, he's much more loving than people realize in the old, much more uh, uh, filled with justice than most people realize in the new. The most violent book in the Bible is the book of Revelation. It's true. And it was written by the apostle of who? Of love. If we do not love, 
If, if we do not hate, I mean, then we do not love. We will all hate the objects uh, of, uh, we will always hate the people that are attacking or threatening to hurt the objects of our love. And so, yes, the, uh, it's the same God. But that question about baptism, why is it uh, that some people believe that you're to baptize only in Jesus Christ's name um, and they think that, uh, that the New Testament people who are baptized are only baptized in Christ's name and then others baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Since it is one God in three persons and the same God, I don't think that we should get hung up on a technical difference like this. Baptism isn't like a magic ceremony where the proper words have to be said or it doesn't work. Uh, as long as you have the biblical Jesus, the, the, the biblical God represented to us by Jesus Christ, I, I don't think it makes a difference. However, there are some Christian groups that make a big deal out of this. So you wonder how I usually baptize people? I'm not saying you or anybody else has to do this, Joshua, but this is another way that I, I've often done it, is I say to people, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I baptize you in the name of Jesus. And then I put them on the thing. That way I cover all the bases. <laughs> and nobody can come to him later and say, oh, you didn't get these words said over you. So that's how I often do it. And, and the, the question, too, is... Um, in, in implying that whoever asked the question that those in the New Testament are only baptized in Jesus name and that's not that's not true there is a portion of the New Testament I think in Mark where it says to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ and then another gospel it mentions baptizing them Matthew 28 in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and so but when you look at the baptism of Jesus Christ the triune God is represented in the baptism. The Father speaks, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, and so the idea is, when it mentions just Jesus Christ, um, there's another portion that mentions all of it, uh, all of the, the, the members of the triune Godhead. And so when we do it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and as he mentioned, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we're obeying a complete revelation of the New Testament and how to baptize um, more so. I'll never forget the story I read, I think, in one of the books or maybe one of the conference. Pastor Chuck Smith, during the Jesus Revolution, um, they were baptizing thousands of people uh, in California at Corona Del Mar. So many baptisms that they would actually um, have dozens of the pastors at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, baptizing people. And they would actually take shifts where they could go back home and have some lunch or go grab some food real quick and come back. And when Pastor Chuck did that, he came back and um, there was uh, one of the groups uh, believing that you can't even be saved unless you're baptized and you can't be saved unless you're baptized and baptized only in the name of Jesus Christ. And so this guy had a circle around him and he was saying, you guys aren't saved and the baptism didn't work because they're baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when Pastor Chuck came down on the beach, um, he grabbed the guy by the collar, he ripped him uh, off of the beach and he said, you better get out of here in a hurry. Uh, is that a true story? Uh, yeah, sure. I like it, if, <laughs> either way, but... Um, it's very important to, it's very important, guys, to recognize all the members of the Godhead in, in so many parts of our lives. I like that here in your building. You have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for noticing that. Absolutely. We did that on purpose, by the way. Didn't you, did you guys notice that too? I did that. You didn't? The She's Father's honest. love, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. She's honest. You know, we did that on purpose to, by the way, to honor the triune Godhead. And then we put that one up there because so many people slander and gossip in the church. We wanted to make sure all of our thoughts are on things above. So we picked some of them. <laughs> um... Listen, guys, there are several questions that I want to combine into one. It's on this one. It's on several throughout here that I was reading. 
is how can we experience the love of God? How do you know God loves us? Um, how, how can you, after years, still believe that God loves you and others? And I, I know where a lot of this is coming from because uh, um, I just received a little book I was talking about on Thursday where a woman has gone through such intense pain um, through rape, through that rape being, um, uh, she contracted AIDS. Um, through that rape, she has been impregnated. And then also in her pouring out of her heart, she mentioned the poverty she's experienced, going without food, without being able to pay rent uh, to, to have a place overhead. So I know this question is being asked so frequently here because so many people in this nation have gone through so much pain. And, and with that, the question is, how do you know God really loves you and how can you experience God's love? This is something that's been very helpful for me. It's to realize that the ultimate demonstration of God's love has already happened. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate demonstration of God's love. I like what it says in Romans chapter 8 at verse 37. It says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's in the past tense. In a very dramatic and decisive way, God has declared his love for his people and in some sense all of humanity by his sacrificial death on the cross. And please listen to me carefully. God can give you no greater proof of his love than Jesus dying for you at Calvary. Now, he can give you additional evidence of his love. He can give you fresh evidence of his love. But what you need to do to remind yourself of the love of God is think of in every dimension what Jesus Christ did for you at the cross. And he did it all with the motive of love. So, we don't have to put ourselves in the position of wondering, oh, I wonder if God really loves me. Now, I don't mean to make light of people who have very difficult circumstances, such as the woman that Pastor Joshua spoke of. I mean, that, that's heartbreaking, and, and we understand that Jesus came to humanity to share that pain in himself. But even to someone who's endured such things as that dear woman, I would say, Look to Jesus and what he did at the cross and think of all the ways that that demonstrates his great love for you. And it's absolutely fine for you to say, Lord, I, I, I need to know your love in a fresh way. I need to recognize it from the cross all over again. But we don't want to put ourselves in the place that sometimes an unhealthy marriage will be. What do I mean by that? I'll explain. Uh, let's just say that in this unhealthy marriage, just hypothetically, that the husband does all these sacrificial things to show his love for his wife, and then the next day, the wife gets up and say, well, what are you going to do for me today? As if what he did the previous day was nothing and didn't happen. Now, we would say there's something wrong with that. That, that it's okay for her to want continuing or fresh examples of love, but we can never forget the greatest example of love. That God, when, when people are sick and I pray, for the, uh, I pray that the Lord would heal them, I often pray this, Lord, I pray that you would heal them not to prove that you love them because you've already proven it at the cross. I pray that you would heal them as a fresh demonstration of that love. Because we don't want to put ourselves in the position of saying, folding arms and saying, Jesus, well, unless you do this for me, you don't love me. Again, that sounds like an unhealthy marriage. It doesn't sound like the relationship that we should have with Jesus. So look to the cross. It's the greatest and most profound demonstration of the love of God we can ever experience.
Um, we have some questions about your commentary. Um, w what drove you to want to write it? What drove you to want to continue finishing the work? Um, it must have been a lot of work they wrote. And uh, yeah, what, what, what made you want to write it and what continued the process? What kind of passion made you complete it? Well, I, I was explaining to a brother during the break that um, I never set out to write a Bible commentary. I never sat down at a desk or a computer and said, I'm going to write a Bible commentary. I, I would think of myself as not being qualified to write a Bible commentary. My Bible commentary is simply the teaching notes that I use in my preaching and teaching ministry as a pastor. And through some very unusual circumstances, I found out that what I prepare for myself as teaching notes was helpful for other people as Bible commentary. Now, when I found that out, by the way, that was about 1996 when I found that out. Uh, when I found that out, I was sort of immediately like, well, wow, God seems to be using this. Now, I, I, I kind of have a passion to complete the Bible. Uh, I'm sort of a, I, I don't know, I, I'm not very spectacular, but I'm like a plow horse. Just hitch up a plow to me, let me take one step in front of another in a very ordinary way, and, and that's kind of the way I work. Um, and so I've just kept at it in a very steady, determined way over the years. By God's grace, of course. I don't think in any spectacular way, but just slow and steady. And even though now I have something that I'm okay with on all the books of the Bible, I don't consider my commentary finished. For me, it'll always be a work in progress for as long as I'm able to work on it. So I'm constantly revising my oldest work and hopefully improving it. So the whole ministry that God has given me to have this Bible commentary is a very surprising and unexpected blessing to me. I, I, never, I never dreamed that God would use my teaching notes in this way. Do you have German ancestry? I do not. Uh, I have Polish ancestry. Okay, Close But that's just kind of dumb enough to just do the work. <laughs> that's better. Um, what are some common misconceptions about the Bible and how can we address them um, to, to our friends, family, people? Well, I, I kind of love the question that somebody brought up before because that is a very common misconception that there's like two different gods in the Bible. There's a God of the Old Testament that's this mean old God and there's a God in the New Testament that's loving and nice. It's, that's a very, very superficial um, understanding of the Bible. And if you would just read the Old and New Testament, you would see that that's wrong. Um, some people misunderstand the Bible by thinking that it's not true. You know, the, the, there's many people who just try to say, well, the Bible isn't true in everything. It gets this wrong, it gets that wrong. Um, but I, I'm here to tell you that the Bible is true in everything. Another big mistake, and I'll just use this one as a third example, people make in understanding the Bible is that they don't understand it according to its context. Context is everything in the Bible. Understanding what comes before a verse, understanding what comes after a verse, and how that may shed light on what God is speaking in and through that verse. How does understanding the original audience of the Bible teachings help us grasp its significance for contemporary believers? Well, it's very important, but I, I will not say, I don't think it's of, it's... Yes, the Bible was written for its immediate audience, and it's important to understand that. Matter of fact, that is one of the most helpful things about a Bible commentary. A Bible commentary can tell you things about the ancient history, the ancient customs, the ancient language, the ancient geography that has a big impact on understanding what a text means. Um, sometimes the Bible will use figures of speech that um, we understand that we use figures of speech that if people were to take them literally, uh, you, you would say, okay, um, 
These two boxers are going to box, and they're going to go head to head. Mm-hmm. So, oh, wow, they're going to go and hit each other in the head? You no, know, we don't mean that at all. It's a figure of speech. And so uh, understanding those things, a good commentary can help a lot with that. So it does help, but we also need to understand that though the Bible was written for an original audience, it's also God's eternal word, and it has relevance for all people in all ages. Maybe not directly applicable, maybe not directly um, addressing every individual, but it has application to every individual. You uh, mentioned maybe a good commentary we could look at. Do you know of a good commentary? I know of a free commentary, and that's good. What are some commentaries that you read? I mostly read older commentators. Look, you know, people are always writing new Bible commentaries, and I I don't want to sound strange about this, but I... I don't read a lot of newer commentaries. When, I, when I'm going through a book and I want to say, what commentators am I going to use? I don't usually say, oh, what's the latest commentary out there on this? So I favor older commentators, though I do use some newer guys. So I'm just going to throw out some names that I, that I appreciate. Uh, Adam Clark, John Trapp, Matthew Poole, G. Campbell Morgan, F.B. Meyer, Leon Morris, Derek Kidner, um, Charles Spurgeon technically only wrote one commentary. He wrote an amazing commentary on the Psalms called The Treasury of David. But in many ways, his preaching was a commentary in the Bible. So I'm always interested in what Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher of Victorian England, had to say about things. So those are some of the guys that come to my mind immediately. And then there's a lot of other value as well um, in the writings of some great, more recent teachers. Uh, Chuck Smith is a guy that I don't listen to Chuck so much. I have written transcripts of what he said. And for me, I'm much more of a reader than a listener. And that's always helpful to look at. One of the questions that before this was talking about uh, the nuances, uh, cultural nuances, that it means something different to them than it does to us. And, and it doesn't. The scripture has one meaning, but understanding historical uh, contexts and cultural ones, one of the ones that really um, I could have not have got a deeper understanding, being an American, Uh, if I would have stayed in America is when Jesus Christ said, unless you hate your father and mother to come after me, you'll have no part with me. American culture is not a shame and honor culture. It's not necessarily a patriarchal culture where the entire family looks to the father to dictate what's going to be the direction of the family. And when I came here, and some of you would come to get counsel on things going on in your family... I would kind of say, well, don't listen to that. Well, you don't have to obey your father telling you that. That's wrong. And it took a few years to realize that your culture is a shame and honor culture. To go against what your father or your mother are telling you to do is like almost the equivalent of your father or mother casting you out of the family and the land. And though, and I want to be very clear on this point, I have become much more sympathetic, much more sensitive in my conversations with you and discussing these issues. And I'm not saying we should disobey our parents for the sake of being independent. I'm saying we should disobey our parents when they're telling you to do something evil. I become more sensitive, I become more sympathetic, my heart breaks over the pressure that your culture faces. My views have not changed that we ought to obey Christ and righteousness over all things. And when Christ says something like that to a culture that is similar to your culture, to the Jewish culture, a patriarchal shame and honor culture, He is saying that because of the intensity of walking away from obeying your father and your mother. Hey, unless you hate your father and mother to come after me, you have no part. We must obey Jesus Christ 
over every single person. No matter our culture, no matter our history, no matter our background, uh, we must obey Jesus Christ. So it's very important to understand the significance of history, culture, as we remember the foundational truth that transcends all cultures of all time. Um, can you explain what it means to pray in the Spirit? When that phrase is used in the New Testament, I think it includes what we would call praying in tongues or praying with the gift of tongues, but I don't think it's restricted to that. Uh, praying in the Spirit, I think, is praying in a way that's truly guided by and led by the Holy Spirit. And again, certainly that includes the gift of tongues, but I think that it's possible for the Holy Spirit to guide and influence us in prayer, uh, even when some of the prayers we pray, as Paul mentioned, with, with groanings that can't be uttered. Sometimes those can be led by and directed by the Spirit. So it, it just means to pray in the Spirit means to pray as the Spirit would lead us and guide us to pray, and, and oftentimes that could be expressed with the gift of tongues, but not necessarily. Along with that, um, can you help bring a biblical understanding of the debate between cessationism and continuationism and of the gift of speaking in tongues? On my YouTube channel, I did a 10-part series. The videos weren't very long, maybe between 10 and 15 minutes long. But I did a 10-part series on why cessationism is wrong. And I just went... You know, I'm not saying there's only 10 reasons, but these were 10 reasons that I thought. And uh, I believe that even the apparently miraculous gifts of the Spirit are available for God's people today. And I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about it. Um, cessationism is wrong for many reasons. As I said, I did a 10-part series on it. But I would say the basic reason is because there's just nothing in the Scriptures that says... God will take away these apparently miraculous gifts and the need is still there for them. So I believe then God, at His pleasure, as His will would, would um, require the will of the Holy Spirit, God distributes those gifts as He will. Um, and so I believe that the gift of tongues is an available gift for believers today, but it's so important to understand what the gift of tongues is for the gift of tongues is not given to prove that you're really filled with the Spirit. The gift of tongues is given so that you can communicate with God on a way that would transcend your intellectual ability. And there's honestly some people who don't feel a need for that. But when you do feel a need for it, then come to the Lord and ask if He wouldn't give you the gift of tongues. Amen. Does anybody feel the need to worship God that transcends our intellectual ability? Yeah, amen. I do. Amen. Um, what is your YouTube channel? What's the name? Uh, if you just search Enduring Word or David Guzik on YouTube, you'll find my channel very quickly. Guys, get on that and look up that 10-part series. That would be helpful. And let me say one more thing about the YouTube channel. Uh, Pastor Joshua said there's going to be questions we don't get to today. Every Thursday, I do a live question and answer program on my YouTube channel. It starts at 10 o'clock in the evening, your time. Uh, I do it at 12 noon, where I live. But it starts at 10 o'clock in the evening, your time. A couple nights ago, I did it from Nairobi. Uh, and occasionally, I have somebody fill in for me. But we just take questions that people enter in on the live chat. And I will say this, you have a better chance, we, we can't take all the questions that come in on that either, but you have a better chance if you're there right at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. of the, if you come in at the last 10 minutes, there's no chance your question's going to get answered. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do the program for about an hour, hour and 10 minutes, uh, every Thursday at 10 p.m., uh, 2200, your time. Oh, man. Tune into that, guys. Can you explain more about the collection of the books of the Bible? Who did it? What's the history of it? And how did they know they were the revealed word of God? Uh, I hope this doesn't sound too spiritual of an answer, but the Holy Spirit did it. The Holy Spirit guided God's people as a whole 
to recognize these books. And they basically had a, a, several criteria for recognizing. It, it had to have an apostolic author. Um, it had to be consistent with God's word. And it also, I say apostolic, it could be somebody who was a close associate of an apostle. So Mark technically was not an apostle, but he was a close associate of both Paul and Peter, and that's why his gospel is included. And it has to be received by sort of the testimony, the agreement of the church together. Uh, These books of the New Testament were just understood and recognized in the first few centuries, but the church didn't go around to making a proper list of those books and sort of enforcing that list until men, really heretics, started coming along and saying, well, Paul's letters don't belong in the New Testament. What? What are you talking about? This is the way it is many times in church history. The church doesn't really address in a focused way an issue until a heretic comes along and starts denying it. And that's how it was with, uh, you know, publishing this list of the books. But it was understood and received, even apostolic times. Peter recognized that Paul's writings were scripture. Paul recognized that some of his own writings were scripture. And so on and so forth. Is the Old Testament a mystery which requires revelation which the New Testament has? Yes. The, well, the Old Testament can only be understood in fullness in light of the New Testament. But you can come to a basic understanding of the Old Testament just by reading it. But if you really want to have it in a comprehensive understanding, uh, it's good to understand how the New Testament uh, speaks of fulfillment of Old Testament things. So the, the two are one message, and uh, God speaks through both. Where is the devil? And does, <laughs> is he in California? <laughs> um, and the devil is most certainly in California. <laughs> And does he still have access to God's presence? I believe that Satan still does have access to God's presence. Satan is described in a few ways that that gives us a location for him. First of all, he's called the prince of the power of the air. Just kind of indicating that he's in the atmosphere and can go where he pleases. Peter also tells us that the devil uh, walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So he is among humanity uh, in the present time. But I also believe that Satan, as many angelic beings, has access to God's presence. I don't believe that God has shut Satan out of heaven yet. The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren who accuses us before the throne of God day and night. There has to be some access that he has to God's presence for that to happen. There will come a day where God shuts Satan out of that access and confines him to the earth. That'll be in the very, very last days during what we call the Great Tribulation. And then sometime after that, Satan will be confined to a pit and prevented from any activity um, among humanity. But right now, he's among humanity. He's seeking to destroy men and women, uh, seeking whom he may devour. He has come to lie, to steal, and to kill. Is the seven spirits mentioned um, all referring to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? What did you say about the atmosphere? The seven spirits. Oh, the seven spirits. spirits. Yes, that is all a reference to the Holy Spirit. I believe it's connected to a passage in Isaiah. I'm sorry I can't give you the exact place in Isaiah. Isaiah 6, Isaiah 7, where there are seven characteristics of the Spirit of God that are listed. And I think that's an indication of the sevenfold Spirit of God. It's not that there are seven separate spirits, but the nature of the Holy Spirit is perfect 
And seven was a number associated in biblical thinking with perfection and fulfillment. So it's just the perfect nature of the character of the Holy Spirit. That's kind of the sense behind the sevenfold spirit. If you go to that passage in the book of Revelation where it talks about the sevenfold spirit in the Enduring Word Bible Commentary, it'll explain that and refer back to the passage in Isaiah. And then can you address um, the, so people will say the spirit of alcoholism, the spirit of lust, and these sorts of things, and then you, it gets even worse into movements where you get people, I pray against the spirit of alcoholism. Can you shed light on those type of beliefs? Well, that kind of talking and thinking is, there's a small aspect of truth to it. And the small aspect of truth is uh, Satan will use whatever weapon he can find. And if Satan can tempt a person to alcoholism, tempt a person to this sin, to that thing, of course he'll tempt and he'll use whatever weapon he can find against people. But what is harmful about that kind of talking and approach is that it can take responsibility away from the person. Listen, I... Of course, we know that the devil can tempt a person to drunkenness, but the devil can't put that, that glass of alcohol to your lips and make you drink it. He can tempt you. And especially for the believer, there is power in Jesus Christ to resist temptation. So we can't blame the devil for things that are our own responsibility, even though we understand that the devil is there to deceive to tempt, but um, the wrong aspect of most of that talking and thinking is that it, it deflects personal responsibility. And, and guys, this is a great question because I mean, we face it around the world. We face it in America, just so you know. It's huge here. And not only does it shift blame, and I, I have so many stories about that. I mean, one time I'm talking to somebody, they said, well, I'm cursed, and I'm filled with depression and anxiety, and uh, I have the spirit of lust. And I'm like, okay, well, you're, you're cursed. You know, we got to go to Galatians, where Jesus became a curse for us. Cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. But I just said, L- let's just stop for a minute. Are you currently living in sin? And this person was like, well, what do you mean? I said, are you living in sexual immorality? Yes. Are you with a boyfriend or multiple sexual partners? They said multiple. Five to ten sexual partners a month, this person told me. I said, I figured out why you're depressed, filled with anxiety and hurting. You are in sin. So let's not blame a curse. Let's not blame the spirit of lust. And, you, and, and here's the other thing about what this does, and it's very dangerous it exalts certain people in our society to be the only ones that can deliver you from such curses or spirits. And you know who those people are? Prophets and apostles. Go to the apostle, get deliverance. Go to the prophet, get deliverance. Go to the pastor, get deliverance. God delivered you when Jesus Christ died on the cross and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We don't... Yeah. When the New Testament addresses personal holiness, the focus is on the battle with the flesh. What we have to face in our own sinful flesh. Just exactly what Pastor Joshua was talking about. And look, we believe that spiritual warfare is real. The devil is about seeking the man. So that there is a place to stand strong against the wiles of the devil, but, but never in a way that denies that the primary battle is in the flesh. Mm-hmm. Amen. And, and guys, this is what breaks my heart, and this is why this place is so freeing with all these terrible churches ar- around. I'm not saying all the churches are bad, I'm, and we're the only good one. What I am saying, it's so freeing here because you've been brought up, so many of us in here have been brought up believing it's the pastor is the only one who can help. It's the prophet. I got to go to a war or I got to do this. God loves you. He died on the cross for you. 
and he wants you to have victory and he's given you the victory of deliverance to have victory over the spirit the spiritual warfare that's so important it's so important remember what the bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world meaning satan yeah i'm so grateful that it didn't say greater is he who is in the pastor yeah greater is he who is in the prophet he said it to every believer if you are indwelt by Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of God, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Yeah. So you don't have to, you don't have to come here and, and uh, pay us to pray for you. And you don't need us to pray for you. I mean, it's good for us to pray for each other. But God hears you wherever you are. So several questions that uh, I'll combine into one. It's the classic, we get them every time, at least 10 about why women can't be the pastor? Why do we believe that women can't, um, well, you know the whole drill. So a biblical answer on this, these many questions that have been asked. Well, let, let me just give you here, first of all, two things. Um, number one, if you want a long, extended answer on this, go to my YouTube channel. Go to a message that I did on the most relevant passage to this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and go to a special message that I did speaking to women pastors. I think the message is a word to women pastors, and I speak to them directly. But I would just kind of summarize it very quickly on this and say, if you are here and you're a woman and you consider yourself a pastor, I want you to know you're my sister in Christ. I don't hate you, I'm not against you, but I want to honor you by being straightforward. I'm not gonna sit here and say, oh, I really don't know, oh, and just try to be polite and so non-confrontational they don't give you an answer. I'll give you a straight answer. I believe that God has ordained male leadership in two spheres, in the home with the headship of the pastor, and in the church with the headship of qualified men. Not for a moment are we saying that every man in the church is a leader or that every man has leadership over every woman in the church. Are you kidding? Look at the list of qualifications in the Bible. It's very strict. And part of those qualifications in the Bible speak, for example, that a elder, a leader in God's church should be the husband of one wife. Now, that's not the only place that indicates that it should be a man and not a woman. So God has ordained male leadership in two spheres, in the home with husbands and in the church with qualified men. And I, I believe that this is God's pattern, this is God's will, and I think that even though it's possible for a family to function if that's not working right, I think it's possible for churches to happen with women leadership, but it's not obedient to God and it's not the best. So th that's how I would say it. Oh, although, uh, let me just say one more thing, just to say. Um, men and women need to work together to accomplish the work of God's kingdom. Yeah. That is absolutely, positively true. There isn't even a hint of the idea in the New Testament or the Old Testament that it's, okay, women, you set aside and the men will do the work of the kingdom. No, 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 no. This is just the idea of headship in the family and in the church. God has ordained this, and God has ordained it, well, for many different reasons, but I'll just say this, that men and women must work together to accomplish the work of God's kingdom. And guys, go back to uh, the Love the Bible conference where Pastor Ken Graves taught on Genesis 1, 2, and 3. When Paul mentions to Timothy in his writings, 1 Timothy 2, he, you, he says, I do not permit women to speak or have authority over men in the church. The, I, the idea is it's not a cultural thing because Adam was formed first and then Eve. This isn't an idea of culture because through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul uses an example of a culture that predated his culture with more years from Adam to Paul than from 
um, Paul to David Guzik. So, so this is a design issue, not a cultural issue. And, and ladies, can I... Last week, or a couple weeks ago, somebody who I've loved, we've really blessed, I've helped in so many areas, I was on the phone with, and they were cursing me out on the phone. Ladies, why do you want to be a pastor? Leave it to the men because God is protecting you from something that he doesn't want you to suffer through. And I'm not trying to gain pity. I'm so blessed to be a pastor and stuff. But my question after, uh, man, it's been, it's been 16 years of full-time ministry is why do you want to be a pastor? God has had so many amazing things for you women to do in the body of Christ, which include Bible teaching. To other women. We just had our Wednesday night. We're having a woman's conference in a couple of weeks. And I, to be honest with you, I want to sit in and listen to Kelsey teach. She's a great Bible teacher. Um, and then we have several women coming from the U.S. To, to teach. Women are excellent Bible teachers. But in terms of being pastors over the church and mixed multitude, God has ordained men to do this. And um, don't get mad at us. Well, don't get mad at God either, but take it up with him. Um, we'll do two more questions. How do you know if it's God's voice speaking to you or just personal thoughts and desires? Well, that can be difficult, can it not? I have a thought, I have a desire, I have a, a dream, so to speak. Is this from the Lord? Or is this just my own thoughts? Well, th there's some kind of immediate tests you can run. Uh, how much does this appeal to your flesh? Um, how much does this appeal to my glory, my, my pride? Th that's a good indication to look at. But even after that grid, um, maybe we say, well, I, I don't know. Well, listen, I would just say, don't be concerned about it. Live every day trying to honor Jesus Christ and God's will will be proven and worked out in your life. Um, so sometimes we don't know. Is this me? Is this the Lord? Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm just not going to do anything radical about it. Just do what God puts in front of me today to honor Him and to obey Him in what I do. When you don't know what the will of God is for you in a particular situation, the most important thing you can do is obey the will of God what you do know right now. Now, I, I don't mean to make this a conspicuous example, especially because Pastor Josh has already mentioned it. But in 1 Thessalonians, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said, this is the will of God concerning you, that you obey, I'm paraphrasing here, that you obey God's commands about sexual morality. So people come and say, I want to know God's will. How can I know God's will? Well, are you obeying the things that you already know are God's will? It's a strange thing to come to God, I want to know your will, I want to know your will. And God says, I already told you my will and you don't care. Why should God show you any more of his will if you're ignoring what he's already shown you about his will? And of course, that does not have to do only with sexual morality, but with a lot of areas of life. So the most important thing in seeking God's will is first to just say, I want to be, no, none of us are going to be perfectly obedient, so we're not trying to earn it. But are there areas of obvious and glaring disobedience in my life right now that, that I need to get right with God? If so, do that. Walk every day with the Lord and God will do what he talks about in Romans. He will prove in your life what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And this is a question that... Um, I get all the time, what, am I supposed to do this? What's God's will for my life? And as a pastor for years, this is just something we get all the time. And remember in John 12, it's something I, I always mention in John 12, where you, you have this 
woman who breaks an alabaster box and Jesus says, leave her alone when they're antagonizing her. And he, she, she, he says, she's anointed this, for, this is for my burial. She's anointed me for my burial. It is possible, we don't know exactly, that she may have believed the words of Jesus Christ that he mentioned dozens of times that he was going to go die on the cross. And every time, the three times this woman was mentioned, Mary, the three times she was always at his feet. When you're at somebody's feet, you have to look up. She, and then in the same chapter, it says that the disciples did not understand these things, referring to specifically Old Testament prophecy, until he was glorified. The word glorified means lifted up. Of course, it's making reference to the cross, but not just only the cross, it's that Christ becomes the Lord of the disciples' life. No longer are they vying for a position where their own greatness can be realized in their lives. I want to be great. And it goes back to what Pastor David taught in the first message. Don't make your, your story, or what, what was it again? What I, I'm already forgetting. Uh, uh, don't make your life, you, you the number one story of your life? Yeah, don't, don't. I messed it up, didn't I? Don't make the goal of your life to live your story and give Jesus a part in your story. That's it. And so when Jesus, it wasn't the disciples' intellect that saw them seeing the Bible clearly and to see the will of God for their lives clearly. It, it wasn't some sort of IQ. It was that these men finally are dying to themselves picking up the cross that God had for them and following Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life. So oftentimes you're going to be very confused if you want Jesus Christ to follow you instead of you following him as King and Lord. Um, and that goes back to religious humanism. Is Jesus Christ simply an addition to make you look good or is he the end of all purpose and meaning Amen. in your life? Amen. There's so many good questions, and let's just do three more real quick. Um, can I advise my mom? Can I speak to my parents about things they're doing wrong or getting out of a terrible relationship that she's in with my father? Uh, a, a hurtful relationship, abusive. This is a little bit of a difficult question for me to answer because that's never the relationship I had with my mom and dad. Uh, my dad passed away a couple years ago, but my mom is still around. And now, praise the Lord, it was never that kind of situation where maybe uh, my dad was being abusive to my mom or something like that. It was never that kind of situation. But just, I, I would never kind of dream of telling my parents what they should do. That just wasn't the relationship that I had with them. But I know that it's not like that for every family. And in certain circumstances, I think it is permitted, especially if it has to do with the safety of somebody involved. And so I would say, uh, yes, that's possible for you to do. You should do it in a very respectful way. But um, if you love somebody, you're, you're going to help them escape abuse or violence or, or be freed from it. And so that, that's what I would say. But I, I acknowledge this is a very difficult situation. Doesn't sin make things very complicated and messy? If, if people would just obey the Lord, how much easier life would be. But sin really complicates things terribly. Yeah. You know, a lot of this is circumstantial. What is your circumstance? What are you yes. going through? And if you need help to answer more specific questions where it's not in a Q&A, would you please come to the pastors of this church Maybe the father is beating the, the mother terribly. Maybe an uncle or somebody or our family member is raping member, females in the family. S stuff like this. Not only do we want to hear what's going on, 
um, and pray with you and, and give you counsel and advice. But also, I am, to my shock, years ago realized that most people don't go to the police in situations in this country. And not only because of the shame and honor thing, but also the police don't do, do, do too much to help us, do they? And so one of the things that I would say is we as a church want to help you. We really do. And we have helped dozens of women get out of sexually abusive situations and women who are being beaten by their husbands. So please, if you do need help, don't live this horror, this nightmare alone. Come to the church, talk to some pastors, and we want to help you, okay? Would you do that? Don't live this alone. We know what many of you are going through. And I think a fitting last question um, would, what makes Christianity stand out amongst all the other religions in the world, and how does the Bible support any conclusions we may have? Well, our God, our Savior, our Messiah, he's alive. Muhammad's dead. Buddha's dead. Confucius is dead. Joseph Smith is dead. If somebody wanted to count Moses as the founder of Judaism, I mean, that, I don't think that's right, but Moses is dead. No, Jesus Christ is the beloved son and he lives. And it's his resurrection that has proven him to be everything he said he was and all of his work on the cross to be valid and, uh, and applicable for everyone who will believe. We serve a living savior and the resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. Yeah. Amen. I'd rather serve a living God than a dead one. Amen. That's why the Mormon tabernacle across the street is dead, because Joseph Smith is dead. Was that too much to end the session? Um, listen, guys, all the relig false religions of the world is reaching up to heaven to yes. have enough strength to drag themselves up. The real religion, Christianity, is a God that comes down to take yes. all of us up with him. And I would rather rely on his strength to bring me up than my strength to pull me up. Amen? Amen. So we, a lot of the questions ended um, by thanking you for your Bible commentary. One of them Praise said the it shaped their theology. And so thank you so much for Praise the, Lord. the enduring word. In fact, the only thing that does endure throughout the ages is the word of God. Amen? Yeah.